All right, thank you, Paul. And I'd like to thank all the people before me who thanked all the people before me. So, uh, so I don't have to do that. A uh, little bit of a complaint here that we actually have a moderator of this panel who is not a neutral party. Um, and, and as usual, I'm going to be the whipping boy, uh, uh, a misunderstood creature since, uh, since the day I was born. But um, I want to say, first of all, very clearly, as I've tried to say in print over the years, we, I've been debating uh, Michael for like 100 years. I think we've had three rounds of of thrillers in Manila. Now, now I feel like the present-day Muhammad Ali against uh, against the still vibrant Joe Frazier. So, uh, so it, it it's delightful to to be here. See, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we, Frazier won one of those, I think. So, but um, anyway, I'm glad I didn't have to do a mano a mano with uh, with Michael again because that's usually pretty tough. But but what I've tried to say for years is that I agree with the ends of the estate tax, the ends of the proponents of the estate tax, like the, the chorus and choir we heard this morning. I, I'm a fan of justice and equality, uh, particularly the discussions uh, with David. I think the, the gorilla in the room, the 800-pound gorilla in the room, is wealth. I think you have to go after wealth. I don't think any major tax reform in America has gone after wealth. What we're doing is we're shoring up the income tax as a wage tax. We're maybe making it more progressive, but we're not getting at wealth at all. And I think we have to do something. The, the title of my paper, the beginning of it, Distracted by Distraction from Distraction, is, is an allusion to a T.S. Eliot line. And I think there's just a lot of smoke and mirrors. The complexity of uh, the fiscal situation in America allows people to make very different rhetorical claims, and it makes it difficult to figure out what's going on. Let me talk about just two examples of that, and then I'm going to come back to something at the end. Uh, example one is how we've come to define the progressivity of any tax change or any tax increase. And with, with due respect to, the, to Paul and people who put this on, I think the Occupy, just getting that in the title, gets us to think the way we score it is we talk about what percentage of dollars from the tax, what percentage of the tax increase falls on the top 1%. So by this measure, the estate tax does pretty well because only rich people pay the estate tax. So it is as often been called the most progressive tax in America. But I would propose a more progressive tax. I would come up with Bill Gates or uh, Warren Buffett. I don't know who the wealthiest American is today. But I would go to the wealthiest American today and take a dollar from him. And I would say 100% of the tax increase came from the top 0.0001%. So it's not really we're comparing apples and oranges. The idea that the estate tax is meaningfully contributing, meaningfully contributing to wealth equality in the country is belied by a 100-year history of the estate tax. I think it's a bad tax in theory. I think it's been an ineffective tax in practice. And I think it's now largely moot after the uh, Tax Reform Act of 2012, the fiscal cliff patch just fixed. We have a $5,250,000 $5, per person exemption for a married couple that's ten and a half million. I'm happy to say here to the Twitter universe, I'm off the estate tax rolls. Um, this is a permanent patch, which means it will last for at least two years. Um, and, at, and in two years, we're going to be looking at, with the inflation adjustments, maybe 5.5 million, and the simple fact that gift and estate tax exemptions never go down. They went down in 1935, from 50,000 to 40,000. That was considered one of the great policy mistakes of the 20th century. It's never been repeated. The exemption levels have never gone down. And the big news in Tax Reform Act of 2010 and 2012 was the reunification at the higher estate tax level of the gift and generation skipping taxes. So that's, real, that's a very, very significant development in the law. We extended the estate tax exemption we increased the gift tax exemption by 500%. Uh, another thing I want to talk about, just a little shout out to Kirk Stark, who is a former student of mine. But I should disclose that uh, I taught him uh, income tax and partnership tax. The idea that uh, middle class tax cuts are, are firm, that we never get rid of a middle class tax cut. Well, one counterexample is the expiration of the payroll tax holiday. So we had a payroll tax holiday, 2%. We dropped the rate down from 6.2 to 4.2. The first time that the payroll tax has ever 
been cut since the payroll tax was put in place in the 1930s. It was the one major American tax that had never been cut. It was cut for two years by Obama. That's a significant middle class uh, tax cut and it was repealed or not renewed. Um, because of this way of scoring and thinking about progressivity, if those of you were following, remember everybody was trying to get, Obama was trying to get like $800 billion in tax increases and Republicans were saying they wanted one point, or they wanted 800 and, and Obama wanted 1.2 and all that talk. At the end of the day, the way the Obama administration scored the tax cuts to make sure they weren't really tax increases and all that kind of thing, was off a 2012 baseline. They're looking at the tax cut, not including the expiration of the payroll tax holiday, which didn't require legislative action. In fact, the payroll tax, the expiration of the payroll tax holiday was by far the biggest revenue increase in what just happened at the fiscal cliff. Uh, the moving of the estate tax rate from 35 to 40 percent is scored, I think optimistically, at $19 billion over 10 years. The payroll tax holiday expiration is $100 billion a year, a trillion dollars over the 10-year period. It is the major revenue increase we just passed, and it is the effective expiration of a middle-class tax cut. But now, I don't really want to spend my diminishing 12 minutes here, uh, my diminishing 12 minutes here, uh, talking, rehashing my arguments against the estate tax, although I'm happy to do that in question and answer. But I want to go to what I see as the silver lining. And I decided, because this symposium is about giving advice to the Obama administration, that I would do so. And it was music to my ears to hear David Miller and others on the first panel saying, you really have to go after the realization requirement. You have to do something about that. For the woman who asked the question, another thing you can do is have a consistent progressive consumption tax. And to do that, you can buy my books. Uh, so I'm happy to plug those, but a shout out to Mike Gratz. Even a, even a non-progressive consumption tax gets at wealth, gets at spending out of wealth, and that's what the income tax doesn't do. But let me go through very quickly three reasons why we should now seriously think about repealing Section 1014. I decided, you know, I've done this for years, for decades, and just to be clear, nobody ever listens to me. Not my kids, not anybody, not my students, not Congress, not any administration. So I thought maybe I talk too much and too long, uh, and maybe my advice isn't couched in terms of code section. So here's my advice. Repeal 1014. Uh, repeal the stepped-up basis on death rule. Let me give you three reasons for that. One, the best reason for the stepped-up basis on death rule has just expired. Under the current exemption levels, which again have never gone down since 1935, they're not going to go down, uh, under the current exemption levels, 99.7% of decedents will not pay an estate tax. But 100% of decedents will pass on assets that get a stepped-up basis on death. So the stepped-up basis on death, and remember in 2010, we ultimately had an option. You could have no estate tax and a carryover basis, which George Steinbrenner took, or you could have a $5 million exemption per person and a stepped-up basis. The overwhelming majority of decedents chose the latter. Stepped-up basis is very big, very important. It's always been linked to the estate tax. Two, the problem of appreciated uh, assets, the problem of unrealized appreciation going out to death has just gotten significantly worse because there's no reason, there's no tax reason, there's no incentive to gift away appreciated property anymore. Capital gains rates have gone up, making the cost, the implicit present value cost of a carryover basis higher, and the estate tax has gone away for 99.7, 99, 98% of people. So with no estate tax to try to avoid, and with a capital gains rate increasing, you hold on to your appreciated assets. They're the least last thing you would gift away, and we're not going to see it. So the problem of lock-in, the problem of um, unrealized appreciation on death is going to, get, going to get worse. And then third and finally, we need some way to get at, at the wealth. We need its wealth inequality. That's the big problem in America. And my advice over the time, again, I tried to make it simple. So my tax planning 101 is buy, borrow, die. Buy, borrow, die is advice for people with wealth. You buy assets that appreciate, like Berkshire Hathaway. They don't produce dividends, like Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, when you need to live, 
you borrow, which is tax-free under an income tax, would be taxable under a consumption tax, would be taxable under Michael's plan. Uh, you borrow, and then finally you die. And when you die, that built-in gain you've been building up goes away. You convert a game of deferral into one of escape. And if you play buy, borrow, die to the limits, which you can do if you have, say, $10 million for a head start, if you play it to the limit, you don't pay any tax. You don't pay a payroll tax because you don't work. Working is for poor people. Uh, you don't get a W-2. Um, you don't pay an income tax for the reasons I just mentioned. And you don't pay an estate tax because that's a net tax on your assets minus your liabilities. You can pass the debt on to the kids. They can sell off the assets. They get the assets tax-free. They sell them off tax-free. They pay off your debt. So if you have capital, taxes are optional. If you have capital, capital sufficient to live on, all major American taxes are optional. And we need to start going after that. A progressive consumption tax does that systematically. It's my preferred solution, fair not flat, how to make the tax system uh, better and simpler. My book from 2002. But if you're not gonna do that, we gotta start looking at those planks. So the buy plank looks to the realization requirement and I'm gonna add in David's recommendation for Mark to Market, which is also Mike Knoll as a piece, David Schakow, um, Michael Gratz referred to Alan Auerbach's, it's, a, it's retrospective capital gains is the nice piece by Alan on that point. So I think you gotta look at that. Borrowing, you know, can, that's, that's a complicated thing, but um, at least death, buy, borrow, die, the stepped up basis, get rid of it. Um, and I wanna just conclude, and I've sort of, you know, kind of, uh, laid the foundation for this with Marty Sullivan. Marty's here from uh, Tax Analyst, Tax Notes, and Marty is great. I think he's one of the most, like all you guys, all you guys at Tax Analyst are great. Let's get that out there. And, and, and by guys, guys include Lee Shepard. Let's be, let's be very crystal clear. No, you're a guy. Um, all right, so uh, here's, here's um, Marty has a wonderful piece uh, that just came out in the Tax Notes that you actually got free today. Um, and, and you shouldn't keep getting it for free. It's a wonderful publication. You should all pay for it. Um, in any event, it's realistically aggressive tax reform. It's on page 150, and Marty kind of goes through things, and then he had a section, 9 to 10, capital gains and dividends, capital gains at death, and he lists as a $128 billion tax expenditure uh, the non-taxation of, uh, of, of unrealized depreciation. The, the estate tax in 2011 brings in about 11 billion. So the 800 pound gorilla in the room is about 12 times, 10, 12 times the size of the unrealized depreciation problem. And then here's this sentence or paragraph, and I did tell Marty, I love you, Marty, I love this piece, I'm gonna make fun of this sentence, and he said take a number. He's already gotten, he's already gotten calls from it. Regarding capital gains realizations at death, there are enormous administrative and compliance issues in switching from step up to carryover basis. We had carryover basis in the Tax Reform Act of 1976 when Jimmy Carter was president. It never became law and was retroactively repealed. We had carryover basis in 2010 without an estate tax. It was retroactively kind of sort of repealed with the optional stepped up basis regime. If Congress wants to increase taxes on the wealthy, these practical issues should prompt it to favor an increase in the estate tax rather than a new tax on capital gains at, at, at death. So three comments to that. Three just closing comments on that. Um, first of all, we're not gonna get a stronger estate tax. We're never gonna get a stronger estate tax. Obama was only ever asking for an estate tax at a 3.5 million and 4%, uh, 40, uh, 45% rate, the 2009 status quo, and the next day, Max Baucus came out and said, not in my house, which, and Max Baucus is a Democrat, chair of the Senate Finance Committee. He said, keep it at five million. They kept it at five million. Um, the proposal that was leaked was five million, 35%. Tom Harkin complained that we were giving away too much to the rich. We should change the income tax thresholds or the estate tax. So the estate tax rate went up from 35 to 40%. We're not gonna get an estate tax. It's a distraction. Stop talking about it. Second, the compliance and administrative burdens are really the problems of tracking basis. They're tracking basis. Um, Dodge and Soled estimate that we get $25 billion a year lost because of overstated basis, just fraud, evasion, bad record keeping, leading to $25 billion a year. We need to get more serious about keeping track of basis. 
And one of my advices to the Obama administration is take those gift and estate tax auditors, they don't have much to audit anymore, 3,706 taxable estate tax returns per year, that's less than the number of members in ACTEC, the American College of Trust and Estates Council. So there's one 706 return for every um, trust and estates expert uh, in America per year. Take the 350 people who work for your estate tax unit and put them seriously into the question of basis. Think of a statutory presumption of zero basis unless taxpayers keep record. You know, get serious about this. Don't, you're so concerned about earned income tax non-compliance, get serious about basis. So I'd get serious about that. And finally, on the administrative and compliance burdens of uh, realization on death, capital gains on death, I'm only gonna say that Canada does it. Canada can't figure out the rules of American football. They have three downs. Uh, they haven't figured out the fourth down yet, but they figured out how to tax capital gains at death. It's doable. It is, as David Miller told me, we were talking before, it is the low-hanging fruit. It's a lot easier than a mark-to-market system. And I think it's something we should do to finally seriously do something about this 800-pound gorilla, which the estate tax was only kind of waving at, and really getting serious about taxing people who live off of wealth. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, we'll now hear from... Jason McCooch from San Diego. Currently visiting at the University of Florida. That accounts for the jet lag. Um, I find myself with a little bit surprised uh, to find a lot of common ground with what Ed has been saying. Um, because, al <laughs> <laughs> because although Ed sees the estate tax in sort of terminal decline or retreat, um, and I guess the gra grass is always a little bit greener on the other side of the fence, and so one is tempted to look back to the income tax for a solution. And I was glad that you finally revealed your, your hand at the end by saying that in repealing the death time step up, you would presumably like to tax gains of death rather than go back to some kind of carryover, if I'm reading you correctly. Yeah, it, 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 there, I, I think. Taxing capital gains of debt is better than carryover. You still have a carryover regime for gift, but if you're not going to do it at debt, at least have a carryover. I have a problem with all of this, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as they used to say in, in, I think it was Yes Minister, I agree with that up to a point. And here's the point. Um, my topic is actually the relationship between perpetual, I should say dynasty trusts, perpetual private trusts. Let's bracket charitable trusts, which are often perpetual, at least they're hoped to be perpetual. Um, so looking at perpetual private trusts, my topic is perpetual trusts and their relationship with the estate tax. And I suppose my point would go equally well to the income tax, whether we were talking about uh, a realization of death requirement or a carryover regime. And my problem is this. Um, in looking at that relationship, starting with the estate tax at least, the standard story that's been going around for the last 10 years or so is that the relationship is a very simple linear causal one, which is that the $1 million, as it was then, GST exemption enacted in 1986 brought about the rise of perpetual trusts that basically didn't exist before then because we had at state level a rule against perpetuities. You're all still here, you're all still awake. The rule against perpetuities, alive and well, uh, indirectly limited the duration of trust so you couldn't set up family trusts for more than roughly two generations, let's say, on average, 90 years, whatever. And the notion was that as long as the state law, state trust law, limited the time period in which you could tie up property and trust for private beneficiaries, uh, that then the estate tax, as it then was, could ride on top of that, confident that even if you removed property from the reach of the estate tax for one or two generations, it would come back when the trusts terminated after 90 years or so. Coincidentally, we're now looking at the final termination of a lot of those trusts that were created in the early 1900s 
with perpetuity savings clauses, they're now finally terminating, and all of that uh, inherited wealth is finally finding its way back into beneficiaries' hands. Um, so the conventional story was that when the million-dollar GST exemption came in in 1986, suddenly there was this irresistible tax incentive, a loophole, a new one, that drove demand across the country to repeal the rule against perpetuities and gave rise to this new phenomenon of perpetual trusts. And sure enough, if you look at the chronology, uh, you'll notice that since 1986, it is true that more than half of the states have either gutted or actually abolished their rule against perpetuities. And if you look in the trade magazines um, of the lower variety, you will notice that they're rife with advertisements pandering uh, to the dynastic ambitions and tax avoidance inclinations and other base impulses of uh, affluent, not terribly sophisticated transferors. And in fact, one recent study um, has documented that during the late 1990s, early 2000s, something like $100 billion supposedly uh, came into trust, private trust accounts in states that had abolished or weakened their rule against perpetuity. So the moral that's been drawn from this is that essentially it's the estate tax, or broadly speaking, the, the estate and GST, the transfer taxes, that are to blame for their own demise and for this gaping loophole and perpetual trusts have now uh, basically, they're not only a, a loophole in transfer taxes, but that they uh, have taken over and the rule against perpetuities is dead. And my problem with this is that on closer examination, there are a couple of, there are actually three inconvenient, I don't know if they're truths, they're inconvenient points uh, that I would like to point out and I go into a little bit more detail in my paper. Uh, one is that the rule against perpetuities never was the rule that Gray announced as a monolithic, across the board, ubiquitous rule. Um, the rule against perpetuities has a much more checkered history, and it was never uniform across the country. And even for decades before the first GST tax came in in 1976, it was possible in at least two or three states, it was possible to create perpetual trusts. You just had to know how to do it. And you had to know how to manipulate the form in which the rule, the rule took in various states, like Delaware, Wisconsin, Idaho were the three that, that spring to mind. So it was always possible to avoid estate taxes even when rates were high, like 77% marginal estate tax rate, in the bad old pre-76 days, when there was no GST tax. And yet, interestingly, here's the second inconvenient truth, uh, is that apparently transferors who stood to gain tremendous amounts by avoiding estate taxes in perpetuity, didn't respond. At least they didn't respond the way rational taxpayers are supposed to respond and are alleged to have responded in the years after 1986. So why not? Why were they content uh, to set up trusts for one or two generations and stick within uh, the traditional rule against perpetuities? Well, it turns out that there's an even more inconvenient point, which is that after 1986, Taxpayers did not rush to start setting up perpetual trusts. In fact, the next state that authorized one uh, took about nine years to catch up. And usually when a tax loophole is enacted, uh, the lawyers, the planners, the people who are gonna take advantage of it don't take nine years to figure it out. This isn't rocket science. Uh, so why did it take so long for the people in Delaware to figure out that uh, they should revamp uh, their existing trust law. They already permitted a version of perpetual trust, but they, they revamped it to attract more trust business. Well, here's the last inconvenient point for the moment, which is, it turns out that if you simply repeal the rule against perpetuities and if you start authorizing perpetual trust, you may find yourself walking into something that's called the Delaware tax trap. In fact, the, the best way to circumvent transfer taxes is not to repeal the rule. The best way to circumvent them is to restructure the rule and retain a shadow of a rule against either suspending alienation or long-term rule against perpetuity. We won't go into that right here. But to retain a shadow of the rule that you can use to pretend that you are still complying with some ineffectual version of it. And some states 
have caught on to that. Others haven't yet. So here's my concern. This is, this is the focus of the paper, really. Is I am concerned that perpetual trusts are being oversold, that their actual benefits are not as great as they are purported to be. They are not a silver bullet. And I'm somewhat concerned, uh, based on the kinds of selling jobs that have been done for perpetual trusts, that the main beneficiaries are probably not the transferors who are lured into putting their accumulated wealth into these vehicles, but rather the bankers, the lawyers, the professionals, who stand to gain immediately by churning fees to set up these trusts in tax haven jurisdictions, and that over the long term, it may well be that the beneficiaries of these trusts and the settlers, if they were still around, looking down from wherever they do after they die, uh, it may very well be that the beneficiaries and the settlers will come to bitterly rue the day that they locked up their million dollars or whatever into one of these uh, zombie-like vehicles that will go on and on and on and never die and over time will become unadministrable. Uh, in fact, I kind of wonder, who uses these trusts? My guess would be, my hunch would be, though maybe some of the, the people from uh, sophisticated estate planning practice can, can contribute a little bit here. Um, my hunch would be that people with a whole lot of money, the really large fortunes, might play with this idea. They might, uh, they might even indulge it by, by, by dumping the spare million or five million these days into one of these trusts. But this is, doesn't come anywhere near to sheltering a large fortune. And for the vast majority of people, one or five or whatever number of million you like simply isn't available. Most people don't have that kind of spare cash uh, to play around with. And so we're talking about a limited clientele uh, with enough money to have some surplus and not enough savvy or not enough sophisticated advice to be worried about the implications of a truly permanent trust. Think about what happens to a dynastic trust once the trustees get their locks on the, the long-term administration. Think of what fees do to overall returns. Think of what proliferating beneficiaries do over time. Think of what a nightmare that creates for trustees and think about what's ultimately going to happen to them, which is probably some kind of judicial reformation or termination process. Anyway, but I think the trust may have been oversold. But coming to tax reform, this is, after all, a symposium on advice to the Obama administration. So where do we come out in offering some ideas for reform going forward? And I guess I have two thoughts on that. One is that the $5 million exemption for estate and gift, and especially for GST taxes, makes no sense at all. Um, as Ed has pointed out, and this is where I really do agree with you completely, um, by opening up a $5 million exemption coupled with unlimited basis stuff up at death, we have basically just opened up a huge giveaway to not even the middle class, but to a large, you know, no, more than 99% of decedents to just escape the basic income tax net, and we've pulled away what used to be uh, at least a substantial countervailing tax. Uh, that offset the benefit of that step up. And that, I think, is hard to defend. Uh, in fact, thinking about it a little further, I'd go a step further and I would say, what's the point in having any exemption for the GST tax? Almost by definition, people who set up generation-skipping trusts are likely to be near the top end of the wealth scale. And if they already get an exemption for a property that they give outright, it is not clear to me that they need an additional exemption. Uh, for now they tie up in long-term trusts. So going forward, how do you accomplish this? Uh, one possibility, of course, would simply be to prospectively curtail the $5 million exemption, at least for long-term trusts in, in terms of GSP exemption. That'd be one possibility. But you say, we've already got uh, several years now in which people have been rushing to create dynasty trusts, uh, they've been grandfathering first one million, and I assume in 2012 they must have done. They must have had a real feast uh, of contributing additional four million plus uh, amounts to those dynasty trusts. 
secure in the knowledge that they would never be subject to a state gift or generation skipping taxes, and presumably assuming that they would still be there generating benefits centuries from now. It's hard for me to believe that you know, thinking back a thousand years ago, some, some states now have thousand year perpetuities periods, a thousand years ago we didn't even have something called a fee simple. Uh, it's hard for me to imagine what things will look like a thousand years hence or even 350 years hence. We didn't have the rule against perpetuity 350 years ago. So is there some way to catch those existing trusts? And here's where you get to uh, a nasty little dispute that has been brewing in the pages of tax notes, courtesy of tax analysts. Uh, we've seen back and forth between proposals to try to clamp down on existing trusts and to limit the GST exemption going forward for those existing trusts. Now, the Treasury proposal, at least the one that I saw most recently, would be a prospective limit on exemption for 90 years going forward. It would not catch any existing trusts. Someone who contributed, this is Professor Wagoner's contribution to the Shelf Project, uh, had a much more draconian idea in mind, which was to try to catch existing trusts, all existing trusts, not just the ones that have come into existence since 1986, but presumably even those grandfather trusts that are still sitting around. And he would like to yank their GST exemption immediately, unless all of those trusts turn around and reform themselves so that they are certain to terminate no later than some perpetuity period that he set down. He gives us three alternative periods to choose from. Uh, but he doesn't want us to choose the longest of the three. And his suggestion is to encourage them uh, to terminate those trusts and to, to, to put an end to perpetual trusts entirely. Since the government was responsible for encouraging those trusts to begin with, we should put an end to them by yanking the tax exemption for existing trusts. That, I think, will be a hard sell, and I'm not sure it's necessary. I think, if my preference if my advice were heated, it would be to shut down the exemption, yes, going forward, but to limit our remedy here to curtailing the tax exemption. And that would give us a good empirical basis going forward to see just what other motivations there are for setting up these trusts. There's no reason to try to strong arm state trust law through the tax code. It's already doing too much as it is. Um, but if we remove the tax incentives, we can then let people make their own mistakes and not have the rest of us paying for it for years to come. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> when Paul and I wrote this article, uh, Paul said, well, why don't you present it, Jim? And I said, well, Paul, um, how about if I'm the moderator and, and, you, and you can present it? And Paul said, well, Jim, you played football in college. And I said, true, but I was I always <laughs> said, true, I was always losing my helmet. <laughs> so um, I lost. And with that caveat, let me start uh, discussing the thrust of our paper here. The estate tax was first adopted in part because of concerns about inequality and dynastic wealth. In this paper, we wanted to reexamine some of the issues surrounding the estate tax. Specifically, we wanted to review whether the studies continue to show that inequality is harmful for our country, whether taxes can be helpful in reducing inequality, and three, whether the estate tax would be a particularly good tool to address inequality. Chart one uh, shows inequality measured as based on income and shows that inequality has continued to grow in the U.S. The top 1% of households measured by inflation-adjusted income has grown 155%. <clears throat> during the period 1979 to 2009. The next 19% grew 58%, the middle 60% grew 37%, and the bottom 20% grew only 45%. The di distribution of wealth is even a uh, more depressing story here. If you look at Table 2, you can see that the share of wealth held by the bottom 80% decreased from 18.7% to 11.1%. If wealth is defined to exclude homes so that we, we are, are only measuring the uh, holding of financial assets, the story is even worse. It's shown in Table 3, the share of non-home wealth held by the bottom 80% fell from 8.7% to 
to 4.7%. And this is the bottom 80%, 8.7% .7 to 4.7%. Is this inequality bad for the US? Chart two succinctly tells the story. This chart is from Wilkinson and Pickett and shows that inequality, uh, shows inequality in the horizontal axis. And again, most of these studies use income inequality because they have had difficulties in measuring wealth inequality. But the horizontal axis shows income inequality with low being on the left at the origin and high income inequality being on the right hand side. And the vertical axis shows the index of health and social problems. Um, as you can see, the higher you are in the chart, the greater the measure of health and social problems, and the further you are to the right, the greater the income inequality. If you look closely in the upper right hand corner of this chart, you'll see uh, the USA is in the upper right hand corner. Now what are the measures of health and social problems that they measured in this study? They looked at uh, life expectancy, the level of math skills and verbal literacy, they looked at infant mortality, homicides, imprisonment, um, teenage births, obesity, and mental illness. Interestingly, while this relationship dealt with uh, cross-country or cross-national data, a re similar relationship seems to hold for states. The authors also looked at uh, the relationship of in income inequality within the various states of the United States and compared that with the index of health and social problems. And you'll see again that there's a pretty good relationship that higher inequality is correlating with uh, greater measures of health and social problems. In the lower left-hand corner, we have uh, states such as New Hampshire, Utah, and Alaska, Wisconsin, and Iowa. And in the upper right-hand corner, we have uh, states such as Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Given the adverse impact of inequality, it is unfortunate that inequality appears to be dy dynastic. It persists from generation to generation. As we discuss at pages 107 to 108 of our paper, a 2012 study by the Congressional Research Service suggests that about 50% of the disadvantage of growing up in a poor family may be inherited by the children. Thus, if the family income was 30% below the average, it is likely that the children will be 15% below the average for their generation. Given the social harms of inequality, it is perhaps not surprising that, the so that these social ills have an adverse on economic activity. There have been several empirical studies that have sought to determine whether inequality can have an impact on economic growth. A 1999 survey of studies summarized the results up to that point and this is quoted at page 109 of our article, it said that, quote, several studies have examined the impact of inequality upon economic growth. The picture they draw is impressively unambiguous since they all suggest that greater inequality reduces the rate, rate of growth, end quote. As shown on table four, this remains true today. All 19 of the studies that have examined the relationship of inequality with long-term growth, and by long-term growth here we mean growth of 15-year periods or greater, have found that there's a negative relationship, that high inequality correlates with uh, low uh, subsequent economic growth. Uh, if you look at Table 4, the Chen study, um, which is referred about to about two-thirds of the way down, is particularly interesting. In the study, he confirmed the relationship between long-term inequality and economic growth. But he also looked to see, well, what happens if you engage in redistributive uh, strategies? Does it have an impact on economic growth? And he found, not surprisingly, that if you start in a society that has a high level of inequality, redistributive policies will increase economic growth. In other words, if you have high inequality, you're going to be able to improve the situation by engaging in redistribution. On the other hand, not surprisingly, if you already have a society that has a low level of inequality, uh, then engaging in redistributive uh, strategies or processes can be harmful to economic growth. And I think that probably is consistent with the intuition that we all have about the relationship between uh, inequality and economic growth. 
The short-term studies, in contrast to the long-term studies, again, the long-term studies are all pretty uniform, or in fact, very uniform. The short-term studies have been all over the place. Um, short-term studies have found negative correlations, they found positive correlations, and uh, it's been difficult to try to determine which of these types of studies should we pay attention to. We think, um, and several economists have also posited that the long-term studies are more accurate because the relationship is likely to be one that manifests itself over a long period. Uh, the, the impact of inequality is probably working its way through educational opportunities, social unrest, and difficulty in enforcing property rights. And those sorts of relationships take a long, have a long-term impact on society, not a short-term impact. So it's very likely that the uh, long-term studies are more uh, reflective of reality. Now the question then becomes, well, can taxes play a role in, in dealing with inequality? And um, it's clear that a progressive income tax can play a role. Uh, income taxes reduced inequality with respect to income by 8.74% in 1978 and 7.3% in 1998. As you can see on Table 5, in uh, 1996, federal taxes reduced inequality by about 5%. The Gini coefficient went from 0.532 to 0.503. And in 2006, however, federal taxes reduced inequality by only about 3.9%, where the Gini coefficient went from 0.582 to 0.560. What about the estate tax? Can it have an impact on inequality, and most importantly, can it have an impact on wealth inequality? It's estimated that between 20 and 80 percent of wealth in the U.S. has been inherited. In 2012, 102 of the Forbes 400 richest Americans inherited their wealth. In 1999, 149 of the Forbes 400 inherited, inherited their wealth. As shown on Table 6, the estate tax does a pretty good job of reducing the amount of wealth transferred from an older generation in the family to the younger generation. In 2006, the largest estates, those with $20 million or over, paid over one-third of their gross estate to charities and to the federal government. 15.57% went to the federal government and 17.83% went to charities. In 2002, the largest estates paid 34.65% of their gross estate to the government and charities. 12.35% to the government, and 22.3% to charity. The effective tax rate as a percentage of the taxable estate has also been significant. Table 7 shows that 43.99% of the taxable estates for the largest estates in 2006, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Table 7 shows that the largest estates had an effective tax rate of 43.99% when measured as uh, a function of the taxable estate. So then, what is the problem with the estate tax? We think that the, one of the most serious complaints has been that it reduces savings. Here, theory is ambiguous about the impact of uh, the estate tax on savings. We might have an income effect where there would actually be an increase in savings. We might have a substitution effect where there would be a reduction in savings. The issue really is an empirical question. There have been three empirical studies that have focused on the estate tax. One study found that the estate tax had no effect on savings. Two others, one uh, uh, issued in 2000, the other issued in 2006, found that the estate tax resulted in about a 10% reduction in reported estates. The question that the authors raise in those two studies is, 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 is this 10% reduction actual decrease in savings or is it window dressing? <coughs> is it simply hiding assets or reducing the value of assets in order to decrease the estate tax? We think it's likely that it's window dressing for three reasons. First, the income tax and the estate tax both have, in theory, potentially an ambiguous effect on savings. They, the substitution effect and the income effect from both the income tax and the uh, estate tax can either increase or decrease savings. Most of the studies for the income tax have shown no impact on savings. And they, indeed, a lot of ink was spilled uh, on the tax 
reform in 1981 and 1986 that Michael Grass referred to earlier, where we had major changes in tax rates being applied to investment income, and they found no impact on savings. What they did find instead was that there was a significant shift from tax disadvantaged investment vehicles to tax advantaged investment vehicles. Secondly, uh, well, given that the income tax has little effect, we think that it's even more likely that the estate tax has less effect. Why? Two reasons. First, when you woke up this morning, did you worry about dying? I didn't. <laughs> I know it's going to happen. In the way I played football in college, I should have. But I, I'm not worried about dying. And I can tell you that uh, most of my clients, when I was in practice, they were concerned about the income tax. They were not concerned about the estate tax when they were creating their wealth. That intuition is captured in this table uh, that was composed by Jim Perturba. He's an economist at MIT. And what he tried to do was calculate what is the expected value, the statistic expected value of the effective, <coughs> effective rate for the estate tax <coughs> during our life cycle. And he based it on two actuarial tables. One is for the general population, and the other is for the annuitant mortality table, which is probably more reflective of reality for estate taxpayers because it's for higher wealth individuals. He found that the statistical expected value of the effective rate for individuals who are less than 50 years old is 0.1%. It climbs to 0.2% when you're ages 50 to 59. At ages 60 to 69, it's 0.5%. When does it start to have a major impact? When you're closer to death. When you're over 80, then it starts to climb drastically. So again, that confirms our intuition that it's very unlikely that the estate tax is having an impact on savings. My time is up. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. And now, Jill Thorndike will um, provide us with some commentary on the papers. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Um, danger in inviting a political historian to comment on a bunch of tax law papers is he's going to talk about political history most of the time. So <laughs> be prepared. Um, there's lots of agreement in these papers uh, on, and plenty of disagreement. Um, maybe, maybe not as much as I expected uh, before I read them. Uh, I'll start with Ed's paper, uh, which I think makes a really pretty compelling case for the irrelevance of the estate tax, at least in, in many terms. Uh, certainly it's a relevance in revenue and progressivity terms, I uh, hate to say that, um, and perhaps in broader fairness terms about uh, its, its ability to back up the income tax. Uh, I think it's, it's, he, he hasn't quite convinced me that the tax is politically irrelevant um, and, or, or politically dead yet. Um, I'm not optimistic about what happened at the end of the year that really we should never, we should all agree never to talk about again because it was so disheartening. But, um, but I do think that uh, I have been recently convinced by the same Elliot Brownlee that got a shout out earlier uh, that that might be the beginning of, uh, of a rebirth for progressive tax ideas and, and real progressive tax ideas in American politics. Uh, we'll see. Open question. But it seems a possibility. Um, I, I think that this paper is great in its uh, compelling focus on unrealized appreciation as really the, the, I think you call it the 800 pound gorilla, uh, certainly is the key to wealth taxation and all the goals that surround it. Um, I think the sort of clarion call for abolishing stepped up basis uh, or curtailing the tax favored transfer of assets, uh, I, I think these, these are good pieces of advice and I'll come back to them in a minute. Uh, the paper offers a great narrative of, of the estate tax's recent decline, especially since 2000. Uh, I, I do think as a historian that this is a, an almost uniquely horrible episode in tax policy making. Uh, the way uh, that tax was destroyed uh, over a relatively short period of time, or, or more actively destroyed, maybe it's been, been destroyed for a long time, but uh, that, that, that process of gradual repeal, full repeal, some replacement, two-year extension, I mean, this is no way to treat what is at least, in some sense, a major portion of the federal tax system. I mean, it doesn't raise a lot of money, but it certainly it looms large in discussion, and it's a terrible way uh, to make tax policy that way. Uh, I like your distinction about the question of whether Congress is locked, is uh, gridlocked on all tax issues or really just tax, tax increases. Yeah, that's right. 
Uh, and I was glad you, you went into a little more depth, I think, on the payroll tax, which is the great exception to this. Uh, that payroll tax exception is so complicated because it's all tied up with uh, the spending programs and the, and the notional relationships between the spending and the tax that I think make it complicated. It's not clear to me, actually, how Congress, if Congress would be capable of doing that ever again. Because in general, I think you're right that uh, Congress, at least now, this Congress, not inclined uh, to take any action if that action would result in a tax increase. Or even to let a, a tax increase happen uh, thanks to inertia. Um, as an aside, I really valued your identification of the carried interest debate as a distraction, again, from larger, more fundamental issues like the capital gains preference. Um, that's a conversation for another time, really. Um, uh, you, uh, you say I'm, that uh, the, the estate tax is no longer the answer to any compelling question, and I'm intrigued by that formulation, um, because I think it is an answer to a series of still compelling questions. It's just the, it's the answer that itself that doesn't work, uh, at least politically, and, and, and as you suggested, substantively, it's simply not working anymore. Um, I, this brings me to a little historical digression. You mentioned that several times you suggest that the tax has never really worked very well, and I, I for one, would love to hear that. Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not aware off the top of my head of a sort of historical analysis taking this back any length of time. Uh, has the tax always been the washout that it is today? Because you've convinced me that it's mostly a washout. Uh, I, 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 maybe it's a misty-eyed romanticism for the past that all historians have sort of genetically but, uh, but I have the sense that it did work better at some point. I, I'm open to being taught otherwise. Um, if, here's a question I have. If the tax is such a failure and such a distraction, why has it stayed so prominent in political debate? What keeps it there? Um, why the durability of the distraction is the way I was feeling it. Uh, I think part of the answer it was in one of the graphs that you had in which it shows that rising exemption over time. Um, I, I think that graph uh, is illustrative. It says something not just about the estate tax, but about the making of tax policy in general, because it's such a transparent giveaway to the most privileged members of society that I think it is that, that the fate of the estate tax over time has bred a lot of outrage, at least on the left, and has given this tax an outsized political role, uh, regardless of its uh, sort of minor tax role. Um, I'm convinced that that prominence is an unfortunate. That um, in many ways, uh, it's distracted us from other ways of dealing with these large pro social and economic problems. Um, I guess I'm less uh, optimistic about whether or not doing something about uh, stepping up basis or <laughs> is actually politically feasible in any way, for the same reasons that we, you know, the estate tax has been eviscerated. That these people are smart, they're not going to miss it, they're not unaware of it. Uh, I, I, I don't see that. I, I see other factors as destroying this tax and that those factors are still are so well at work. I'll skip the next few things I was going to say and move faster. Um, I, like, uh, I, I, I like Grayson's paper on the, uh, on the GST the, the, and the what, who killed the rule of perpetuities, uh, the rule of perpetuities. I think that was, um, that's, that's the kind of paper that appeals to a historian. It problematizes an accepted narrative, which is what historians do for a living, uh, and it takes it uh, a very uh, his, it takes a historical look at how this happened and looks for causality uh, in in this process, um, which which I find to be convincing almost all the way through, um, focusing on 1976 and then even more on 1986. Uh, the paper really suggests that neither of these watersheds were pivotal. Um, and that the decline of the rule might have happened anyway. Uh, and there's lots of discussion about how various events hastened the changes that were already underway, and this strikes me as a, as a much more plausible argument than any argument that tries to you know, explain long-term trends with quick little watersheds, which just never seemed very convincing to me. Um, that's the kind of complex, nuanced, obscure uh, explanation that historians are fond of. I think, I think it works well. Uh, the paper is really nicely sensitive to context, uh, particularly the economic context of the 1990s, and try to tie that uh, to the process of the legislative uh, and legal reform that's going on around this. Um, I was really fascinated by your discussion of the marketing involved in, in these trusts. Uh, your discussion of the people the marketing was aimed at. Uh, I know that this may well not be the burden that you're taking on for your paper, but there's a socioeconomic story about 
uh, tax policy making and, and the marketing of tax policy uh, that's in that that I, I, I would love to hear more about because I think that if you can get at the role of, say, these uh, rich but not so rich crowd, I was trying to come up with a phrase for them, they're almost petty bourgeoisie, um, <laughs> but, but uh, that they can be brought into a tax policy discussion that's really more about rich people, but you can develop a product, market it to them. Um, I think they're that can they're called them. delusional optimists. Well, well right. I mean, and that's, we explain much of the estate taxes decline to those delusional optimists. So. Uh, I, I would love to hear more about that. I don't know if that's not really where your paper wants to go, I think, but, uh, but it was, that's where I'd love to see it go. Um, all right, last part, and then I'll shut up and get out of here. Um, so then we have this great defense of the, uh, of the estate tax as, as vital. Uh, I like the way you start by dangling the hope of pro-growth tax reform, uh, estate tax reform out front, because this is really stealing a march on conservatives who, that is their new line. And I know because I'm, I'm part of it, I have to confess. They, the uh, Bush Institute has something called the 4% Growth Project, and their idea is to remedy all problems, inequality included, by just growing faster. So if you can come up with a tax policy, it's only 4%. That's only, you know, 30% higher than the average historical growth rate in the last 50 years. What's the problem? <laughs> Uh, but uh, if you could actually find something like that, a progressive reform that's also pro-growth, which is that's not uh, unprecedented. People used to describe the income tax that way. Uh, that's a great thing. Um, I think you, uh, you, you, go, you go through a uh, very compelling description of all the problems surrounding inequality. Certainly its existence is, I think, undisputed. It's growing, uh, it's growing size and seriousness. Um, uh, the, I, was, I was interested in your discussion of the particular problems that flow from inequality, the health problems, uh, some social problems like imprisonment and things. Those all make sense to me. I know you're just doing a survey of other people's work here. Um, but I was struck by the fact that these things don't seem to be improved uh, regardless of level of average income, which is a really puzzling outcome for me. I don't, it doesn't come clear to me why that would be. So I'm a little bit interested in the mechanisms here. Uh, and I'm quite interested in your central claim that inequality is correlated with subpar growth. And that's where I really want to know what the mechanism is, uh, more specifically. The correlation is great, but is, uh, I mean, is there a Keynesian argument working in here somewhere? Uh, I just, I, I couldn't really take away from the paper, and maybe I missed it, and you can tell me so. Uh, but that, that's what I would like to uh, have a little bit more uh, understanding of. Um, well, I'll jump ahead a little bit here. Uh, there's obviously plenty of disagreement among the papers about the actual efficacy of the tax and its related levies, uh, but I think you have an make an observation almost in passing, and it's really the one that I started with here, about the vigorous efforts of the state tax opponents. And I think this is an important data point. It's hard, because it's, it's not the kind of data that we like, right? It, or the kind of data you all like, and <laughs> you don't like, and I do. Uh, it, it's a political data point. And I think that it's incumbent upon us to understand why these people hate the estate tax so much if it is so completely voluntary. Um, and once it's been turned into a shell of its former self, why still proceed looking for repeal, for full repeal? Why resist full repeal when you've eviscerated them already? And you probably have an answer. And I, I don't think anybody could look for repeal. I think the dynasty trust crowd is very happy. What they did look for repeal for a long time, and they were yeah. already eviscerated. So I, I, I'm puzzled by that. And maybe it's... Um, misunderstanding. Although that means that all those tax lawyers are advising them are confused too. So The super rich may have become our latest discreet and insular minority. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, I, I think that the resistance of rich people to, to progressive tax reforms or to existing progressive taxes is an important thing that we need to understand. Because you either one answer you get from the left a lot is that these taxes are a sham, they don't really do anything, nobody should care about them. Then you have to explain why the rich actually care about them so much. Um, generally speaking, I think, talking about the estate tax, I, I like the way that, uh, that we're, gonna, we're trying to problematize the role the, uh, inequality plays in the development of these taxes. And, and I think really the, the take-home question here, and it might be a little depressing for people who like these taxes, is that I think that they have never, to go back to the, historic, the deeply historical point, the tax has never really been designed to remedy the biggest problem, right? If inequality is the problem, the estate tax has never really been the answer. Uh, the estate tax has traded on that, uh, but it's never really been used to fix that per se. In my mind, it's all about the spending. Uh, you know, it, it, 
that's the, those are the major changes that have been made. And the, the European experience would suggest that this is true as well. It doesn't matter what tax systems you have in place. As long as you have enough money, you can fund redistributive uh, spending programs, and that does the job more effectively. I, I tend to view the estate tax that way. The estate tax, I think, uh, not, to, not to disagree with my mentor, Elliot Brownlee, uh, but I do think it sprang from a, a fairness argument, but it really springs from an argument over um, the redistribution of the tax burden, not the redistribution of wealth or income or anything else like that. It's not remaking society so much as just making the collection of revenues a little more fair. That's a much more modest goal, uh, much easier to sell in a democracy. I think efforts to address inequality head on as these people are just too damn rich and other people are too damn poor are historically not successful in American politics. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right, that's it. Well, um